Hi, welcome to Let's Talk Careers. I'm your host, Lisa Bauman. Today, we're going to be talking with Samantha George, who is the project coordinator for the Smart Center here at Conestoga College. I really enjoyed our conversation. We talked about her journey from advertising to project coordinator. We touched on themes like mental health, finding balance, and a new personal narrative. I hope you enjoy. Welcome, Samantha. I am so glad that you are here with us today. Um, I'm going to get you to start by doing your elevator pitch. You can introduce yourself, maybe using our James Bond method, and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me on. Uh, so my name is Samantha, Samantha George, and I am a project coordinator for the SMART Center, which is an acronym for the SMART Manufacturing and Advanced Recycling Technology Center. It's a research center here wow. at Conestoga College. Yeah, that's cool. And a Some, little bit something about me is my mission or goal in life is to make people feel seen, heard, and valued and respected, and most of all, appreciated for who they are and what they bring to the world. That's wonderful. So why don't we get started and we'll, we'll start off with some of those early career journey parts <laughs> of your story. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, your maybe what you wanted to do when you were growing up and then kind of getting into university or, or post-secondary and then um, kind of going from there. So I was the kid who wanted to do anything and everything. I wanted to be a dancer. I danced for 16 years. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be Patch Adams, so to speak, just making people laugh, um, a veterinarian at one. There was never really an end goal. Okay. If there was going to be one thing in common with all of those goals, it was to bring people together. And I feel like I'm, a, I'm doing that now in a different capacity than I could have ever imagined. I didn't realize I would want to be a project coordinator for yeah. a research center for manufacturing and recycling. Okay. Like, didn't have any idea. Um, but so growing up, it was all the different things, just throwing the spaghetti to the wall, seeing what, uh, what stuck, so to speak, an Italian background. So you'll hear a lot of pasta references. Sounds good. <laughs> um, so... And then it, I transitioned into, um, I worked in the service industry uh, at Black Shop Restaurant in Cambridge for a number of years. And I started out as a hostess and then went to a server and then went to a bartender. And um, I feel like everyone needs to work in the service industry in some point of their life. Yeah, I agree. Um, to understand people, yeah. to understand how you react in high pressure situations. Okay. Um, and it taught me a lot about other people, but also taught me a lot about myself. Cool. So. Can I ask you, what, yeah. was, what was the rate of pay for that first job? So when remember? I think it was around $8 or so. Okay. Or $8.30 an hour. That's awesome. So what happened from there? You're working at uh, the restaurant in Cambridge. Yep. You kind of, um, wh wh where did it go from there? Uh, so I actually applied to Conestoga um, a year before I started working at the Black Shop. Okay. Um, things got lost in the shuffle in terms of application, and I never received my acceptance package okay. just because from moving and this and that. And this okay. is before everything went digital. Gotcha. Thank goodness it did. Um, so I never received my acceptance package, never got to go to my portfolio review. I went uh, to Conestoga for advertising. Okay. And so I thought, oh, I wasn't accepted. Um and so I decided to work in the restaurant industry and then applied again and was working at a side hustle. I started my own photography business mm. so I could increase my portfolio because sure. I thought it wasn't good enough. Okay. The first round. Okay. Um, and then went into the advertising program in 2010 and haven't looked back since. And it's been phenomenal. So how did you go from advertising to project coordinator? Fun, fun story. It's so it started off with advertising. Um, and then from an employer's perspective, I was a work study student in my second year and um, working for the School of Media and Design, now the School of Creative Industries. Um, I was a work study student and I had the opportunity to work on um, an international trade show called SIGGRAPH, which uh, reviews media techniques. So I'm really condensing it. Um, but it was held out in Vancouver, and I worked with a number of fa number of amazing companies within Kitchener Waterloo, City of Kitchener, EA Games, University of Waterloo Games Institute, um, travel and tourism, and they actually flew me out for the entire conference um, to see all the work that I had done for this, like wow. logistics, creative direction, and all that. Um, and then after the Vancouver conference, I was doing this while I was a student. Okay. 
Um, and then after I graduated, they called me back and asked me to be a representative of Ontario at the conference in Los Angeles. And wow. so we did that for a week. I'm assuming this is all pre-pandemic. Oh, this is back in 2011, 2012. Okay. Cool. Um, and then so did the 2012 conference. And then after that, um, I had still kept in touch with my faculty members uh, from the advertising program. And they are phenomenal people. All they wanted to do was see me succeed and help me along the way. And I'll, I'll never forget one of my faculty members, um, Susan Shilton. She said, hey, I have this, uh, I know someone who works in the International Education Office. I know that they're going to be posting soon. Can I put in a reference for you? Absolutely. I had never traveled abroad other than to LA. And the position was to be the activities coordinator for the International Office. Um, so from there, um, I had the experience of being the activities coordinator and my greatest achievement or accomplishment would be uh, developing relationships with, um, I created a volunteer program with over 330 volunteers from 26 countries. Right. And so, so just to clarify, this was all here. In, this was here at this at the at a part-time contract working for Conestoga, brand new you know, never traveled the world and to hire someone who had hadn't traveled. I was like, are you sure you know what you're doing? Right. <laughs> right. Um, but it, it, I was curious. I wanted to travel and I felt like I had the opportunity to travel the world, learn new languages, try new foods, try different dances. Right. But from the comfort of my own city. Gotcha. Um, That's clever. So I had just incredible experiences. And so part of that role was, um, taking the international students. And again, when I started international, it was about 600 students. Okay. And so we went all around Ontario to like Canada's Wonderland, Grand Bend Beach, Ripley's Aquarium, like, to see all these amazing attractions, but then also to help the students um, acculturate to Canada. Right. Um, so from there, I then wanted to have uh, more time for myself because I was on the student schedule and I had transferred from a part-time contract to a full-time support staff contract. Um, but I want, I needed more time for myself because I wanted to go back to school to complete my degree. At this point, I only had a two-year diploma in advertising, so I wanted to complete my degree. So then I transitioned into the Advancement Alumni Relations Office at Conestoga. And I supported the Chief Development Officer for a little while. I supported uh, all of our development officers, our alumni manager, um, helping redo um, a lot of our marketing and communications efforts like e-connections, an alumni newsletter, um, a digital an alumni newsletter, um, uh, the alumni portal. So where uh, alumni could go and get access to new services and things like that. Um, and then from there, I moved to the School of Health and Life Sciences to because uh, to support the executive dean. Right. Um, and to learn more about what the student journey is from that regard. Okay. Um, and support the executive dean. And then between the School of Health to where I am now, I had uh, a two a two month or so um, mental health break. Okay. Um, and it really allowed me to focus um, and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And okay. I loved everything that I had done before, um, but it allowed me to focus and and come to now this opportunity of project coordinator. Yeah. So taking all the skills I had learned elsewhere and apply it to. Sounds yeah. like a, <laughs> a, a quite a, um, an ebb and flow of your journey. Yes. Yeah. Lots so of twists and turns. There's two places I want to dive into. I'm going to start with um, the role of your faculty and how important they were in kind of those first opportunities. Um, so tell me a little bit more about what that sort of job search looked like for you as you were kind of navigating. All right. So I'm here in this program. I'm a work study student. So for those who might not know, work study is opportunity to work on campus doing different projects. So tell me a little bit more about sort of how you see those things intertwining and making, making, um, the most out of your sort of your career search journey or your job search journey, at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as a work study student, my faculty were integral to that process from always telling me, you know, network, network. Um, and we had the opportunity at the time to work out of the Communitech sandbox. So Conestoga had a footprint there. And I didn't want to just network with people I was working with. I wanted to network with everybody and anybody go to all of the, um, the events, 
even things that I knew nothing about. You, you go there and you and you find people, you get them to talk to, and you practice your communication skills and you practice asking questions. And I feel like once you've mastered the art of asking intelligent, curious questions, mm -hmm. you're able to then com carry a conversation in any capacity. Um, so, but my faculty members were really supportive and in that journey. And I didn't know it would lead to a 14 year career here at Conestoga. It right. was, Hey, you're great at events. We had an events course in our, um, in our advertising program. And it was, you're great at events. Why don't you try this for a little bit? And then I fell in love with it. Wow. And so I'm here 14 years later. Yeah. 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 So the second part of your journey sounds like, um, and this is kind of a question that I ask, uh, people is, was that, you know, you talked a little bit about a mental health breakdown yeah. or a mental health um, crisis. It sounded like that was a really key and pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you would mind sharing a little bit more about that process and what it meant for you in terms of your career now. Sure. So leading up to it, I was always this happy-go-lucky, everything is perfect, everything is wonderful. That was the projection I, I gave to everyone, including myself, to be quite honest. Um, and I was just the, I'll say yes to everything. If I don't say yes, it means I'm not good enough. Um, and I could see the writing on the wall, so to speak. I was crying a lot more, but in private, cause I was ashamed that I couldn't say no to things. Um, and then it was eventually when my, my son, um, he's now five. Uh, so three at the time, um, looked at me, wiped a tear away. He's like, mommy, you don't need to cry. And it was over work and over personal stuff. And it was, I let my personal bleed into work because there really is no, you can't just shut it off when you get to work. It's 9 a.m. I'm going to leave my personal stuff behind. It, for me, that was impossible. And so uh, I remember sitting down with my doctor at the time and she had said, have you thought about this as an option? Because you're, you're not functioning at the person I know. She's been my doctor since I was a like, yay big. Um, and I did, I said, okay, like I'll, I'll take a, a leave. At first I felt guilty because what, what is everyone going to do without me? Realistically, I'm not that important. Everything went on, but I felt the sole weight of the world on my shoulders at that time. Um, and then I, I didn't just sit around and watch TV and, you know, cry in a corner. I did for the first few days, don't get me wrong. But if anything was going to change, I had to do the work I had to put in the work, so to speak. So going to therapy and multiple therapists, because I remember a friend gave me some fantastic advice was find a therapist when you're at your best, not when you're at your worst, because you're not in a place to make those types of decisions. Find someone who will support you when you need it. Um, and so I had already found a therapist at this point and, um, and so we started connecting more and just diving into anything and everything. And then journaling and meditation, self-reflection. I had never really done any self-reflection up until this point. I would always just say yes and the whole drama speak. Yes and, yes and. And then once I did the reflection, and it's still a journey, don't get me wrong. I, I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. And, um, and I would, when I would tell people that, it was well, you don't look like you have anxiety or depression. And I, part of me wanting to talk about this was depression and anxiety don't have a look. You can't tell from the outside. So I think if we can talk about it a, more openly and authentically, it, it creates that safe space. It, like when we're vulnerable, we give other people permission to be vulnerable with us. So it was a, it was a really big deal in my career wise to take that mental health break circling back to that because when I came back from the mental health break I was more empathetic to what other people were going through that I would check in are you doing okay are you um do you need help are you like if you're not having a good day you don't have to tell me why sure. but just know that it's okay. Like we're all yeah. people. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like that really propelled me to want to be able to make everyone feel included and seen Yeah. in that regard. How was it coming back? 
How was it those first couple of days coming back? Oh, your... I was so nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what is everyone going to think about right. me? What were the rumors? It was right. Um, and I just, I kind of just had to own it and say, I can either hide behind it yep. and not say anything to anyone and let people think what they want, or I can be, or I can write my own narrative. Right. I love that. I love that. Wait, I love that. (laughs) Um, So I, I controlled the story, so to speak. And again, where the advertising comes in, what do you want people to know about you? And so I decided to open up to with people that I was close to. And then when I did, you could see, oh my goodness. And they felt the opportunity to open up about them. And when I'd say like, oh, I have anxiety and oh, I have depression or anything like that or OCD and, Mm. and, um, it let them realize that I'm not a robot because right. there was the ongoing joke that, oh, nothing can get Samantha down. And it's gotcha. like, no, no, actually, like, that's let's not true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was scary, but empowering at the same time. Yeah. So tell me more about that empowered feeling. So I came back. Uh, so I was working with the School of Health and Life Sciences. And then this opportunity to be yeah. the project coordinator presented itself. Okay. And so I took that as a fresh start Mm. rather than trying to go into the same role and change everything. Um, I went back for a few weeks, wrapped up some things and then new team, new location, new me. I, um, I felt empowered because I did the work and I'm still doing the work of figuring out who I am. And I think it's easy to say, be authentic. But you can't be yourself until you know yourself. Right. And so beautiful. Yeah. um, Doing the work of self-reflection. And I still do this weekly. Every Friday, I I allot a half an hour to 45 minutes. What could I have done better? Mm -hmm. What uh, boundaries could have I have set up? Work and personal. Right. Like, it's okay to have boundaries at work. Yes. (laughs) It's okay to not over explain. Although I'm here doing a podcast explaining my (laughs) life away. Um, (laughs) It's, it's okay to not over explain if you don't feel comfortable. And I learned with some people I wanted to. Right. And the empowerment was I got to choose. Right. I got to choose who heard my story. Right. I got to choose what my story was to other people. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was really empowering to go yeah. to a new area. Yeah. yeah. One of the questions I want to ask you about is how you might describe this moment of where you are in your career, maybe you wouldn't want to call that as a, a stage or a phase. How would you sort of describe that in, in this moment? Without sounding very corny. That's okay. <laughs> I am still learning. Uh, I am learning how to be a leader, even without the title. I'm still learning how to empower a team and to make the team feel seen and heard and valued and respected and to build that team and to go through the difficult moments. And I remember hearing a quote that said, if you can't have the difficult conversations, you're going to have difficult relationships. Uh, Oh, that's brilliant. (laughs) I like that. I'll have to figure out who said that. Yeah. Um, And so it's having, learning to have those difficult conversations, but knowing that something positive is going to come out of it. Um, learning and just growth. And I don't know if that answers your particular question from a season's perspective, but I'm just taking in all the information I can right now to better educate myself, to better make decisions for myself that will benefit myself, my family, my future, um, rather than just saying yes to everything. Right. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about sort of the company and the industry. Now, obviously we're Conestoga College, you are in this role. My question is, and I I feel like I already sort of know the answer. So why did you choose this industry? Although I feel like the industry chose you. Yes. (laughs) So maybe you could talk a little bit more about that part. I'll start with Conestoga. So the industry chose me um, in a sense. I love post-secondary. I'm still completing my bachelor's degree in communications right now. Um, I feel like once you think you've know it all, you've essentially knew nothing. Um, the joke is you never stop learning. I feel like that was one of our campaigns at at a certain point at Conestoga. Um, but 
Students, we are all here because of our students, whether they're international, domestic. We, are, we all have jobs here for students. It's students are coming to Conestoga or to any post-secondary because they want to better themselves, better their family, better their future. It is a place where people come to be better. And it chose me because I had always thought I needed to be better. But now I'm at a point where I want to be better. So, um, yeah. And, and, and the Smart Center? So it chose me. Okay. Um, I, to be quite honest, knew nothing about Conestoga's research area, about manufacturing, recycling, technologies. But I knew uh, someone who worked um, within there. It was actually one of my previous volunteers uh, when I was in it, working in the international department, they're now a project manager for the smart center. And he had always said, Oh, I love it. It's fantastic. The people are great. And I felt like that was somewhere I needed to be, uh, from a people perspective to help me as I was coming back from mental health leave. Okay. So I needed the team more than the work. I could learn the work, yeah. but I needed the team to help me and I could help the team. That is such an interesting perspective. Um, and it also leads me to sort of my next question around, like, what, what skills do you think are the ones that you use the most in the work that you do mm -hmm. in relation to the team? And then what are, and then we can kind of separate that in terms of what did you feel like you could learn along the way, right? Because a lot of people kind of come in and they're like, Oh, I have to, I have to know all this technical knowledge. Right? Mm -hmm. and a lot of students are saying, I need to know all this technical knowledge. And I spend a lot of time talking about, you know, you really need to build those soft skills. You really need to build the communication skills. You need to build that conflict management skills. You need to, yeah. you need to build those things because, you know, the, when you get into the workforce, the employer is going to train you on mm -hmm. those technical parts. Yeah. Right. So to me, it's that shift in emphasis mm -hmm. um, between that that team, yep. right, which I think you beautifully explained towards the, the knowledge. So what are some of your favorite skills? I'd first, I don't use the term soft skills. Okay. I go f towards human skills because okay. they're skills nonetheless. Absolutely. It's just a, yep. I don't coin that. That's Simon Sinek. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's about the skills that I use the most are my people skills. It's you know, shaking hands with everybody in the room. It's getting to know people. Um, little things like putting away my phone when I come into a meeting because you have your phone and it's there and people just see that and they go, oh, well, I'm not the most important thing in the room. So you leave that, you turn it off, whatever. It's the, you know, leaning into people. It's, it's essentially all the people skills um, that have helped me in every part of my journey. Like you said, you can learn the technical skills, but you it's harder to master the people skills. I'm not a master by any means. I'm still learning. Um, but the skills that have helped me the most are actively listening and not thinking of a response while someone is asking me the question, because then I don't hear the entire question. I'm more worried about what I'm going to say. That, that's not the point of a question. Um, so taking time to think. And I remember one of my... Um, one of my managers, uh, when I worked in advancement, gave me some fantastic life advice was save as draft. And essentially, um, I had said, oh, I'm, you know, this is really upsetting me, blah, 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 blah. And I was writing a scathing email. I'd never wrote it. And she looked at me, she's like, save that as draft. If you still feel strongly, send it the next day or the day after. Right. Um, and that has helped me numerous times yeah. to calm myself down. <laughs> Sober second thought. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's dive a little bit more into your role as a project coordinator. I have a couple of um, kind of follow up questions. Um, first, describe a little bit about what it looks like in your day to day, sort of in the day in the life of a, of a project coordinator. And how would you sort of define the differences between your role and let's say, you know, talked about uh, project managers and maybe engineers. Let's talk a little bit about about that. Sure. Um, quick overview is there is no day to day. Everything, okay. um, is comes, comes as it is, so to speak. Um, typically, so I work on a lot of the processes and procedures that help with student retention, um, for students that work at the, any of the research centers. So out of the office of research services, I 
uh, reported to them for a number of for about two years. Um, developing fee for service uh, processes that would help facilitate uh, working with industry partners and, and different centers um, to help bring in um, money towards Conestoga College if they weren't eligible to work with a government funded agency. They could just pay us. Um, working on events, um, symposiums to recruit faculty members, symposiums to recruit industry partners, uh, promote what we do within the research offices um, at Conestoga. Um, but right now, as I've transitioned from working from the Office of Research Services to now working with just the Smart Center, um, my goal in mandate is to support the um, the project managers. So the project managers typically will work with the industry partners um, on the applied research project. And I, I guess I'm going to say, well, what is applied research? So applied research is essentially the ability or the application of industry experienced faculty members working with current students um, paired with a industry partner to solve the industry partner's problems. And the outcomes are typically proof of concept, uh, prototyping, testing, simulation, a number of other things um, that we provide to the client uh, or to the industry partner. So the project manager is that intermediary between outside and inside, and they facilitate um, the learnings of the students with the faculty members on the project or the um, and then with the partner. So for my role specifically is to make their jobs easier. We need to capture the history of what we've done. We need to be able to like SharePoint, like organizing. That's where my skill set comes in is to okay. be able to support them. Okay. So I can imagine then that your um, experience in advertising and events yes. is a critical part of the role that you do now. Is that, would you say that that's? Yes. Yeah. Yes and no. Okay. So advertising, I learned how to do a lot of writing, uh, whether it was copywriting um, or things like that, making things look good. Okay. Um, so doing, learning uh, Adobe Illustrator, Adobe InDesign. Now we have Canva and Adobe Express, which makes everything so much easier. Um, that's I'm saying how old I am now. Um, so all of those uh, features, Adobe InDesign such, um, events, um, marketing. So it gave me a very good generalized background to be able to understand the specifics of any industry. So I didn't necessarily take what I learned in the classroom from a technical perspective and apply it. I was able to take how I learned, like, am I a more auditory learner? Am I a more visual learner? How do I remember things better? Like how you take notes is really imperative in the classroom to how you're going to take notes in a meeting. Um, so it's applying the, the human skills I learned in college. Right. And, apply, and I'm now I'm able to, able to apply them as a project coordinator, as an activities coordinator, whatever the case may be. Yeah. How did you kind of find out about it and, and get into that area? So I would always look at the employment opportunities page at Conestoga. I see. And I would see where are we hiring? Because right. we're always hiring for what will be. And so I feel like talking with the professionals from HR, HR is not a scary place. Right. The HR people are there to help you. They're human resources. Yes. Um, you know, and making the connections, networking, um, while you're in any given role. So again, I've, I've been here for 14 years, but I've worked with 85 departments. So <laughs> it's, it's like, okay, well, what do you know about this role? What do you know? Oh, not much, not much. And then talking with my friend who was the project manager and had great things to say. Um, so I feel like researching in terms of don't just look at what your department's doing because you're a part of a collective whole. So how does working with international students correlate to the research center? So from step one to where I am now, well, we hire international students to work on our projects with industry partners. So I wish I would have known that then because I could have said, hey, you could apply to work there. Right. Um, so it's always trying to advance your knowledge in what the overall organization is doing, not just solely focus on your 
your area. area. Yeah. I, I, I tend to follow the careers page yes. all the time as well. I yes. find it a fascinating source of information. And I also love how you talked about like the networking, talking to friends, talking to people, um, and, and, and just being curious and finding out more about what are the, what do these areas do? What are these different pieces of the, you know, different pieces of the, of the college and how it all operates. Yeah. Right. And I found when I worked um, at Dune campus again, before COVID, it was easier to have those run-ins. Yeah. Um, now post COVID area era, it's just by email. And what I've started to do since I came back. Um, so since I stepped into this role was if I would be emailing someone, asking them a favor in terms of, can you process this payment or whatever from a different area and someone that I didn't already know, I'd offer to meet with them and get to know them as a person, even if for a 30 minute virtual, uh, yeah, just, yeah. Hey, let's just chat and get to know each other. You're not just a name at the end of an email. You're, you're a person, you have a story. Yes. And then it's like, Oh, well you should talk to this person. You should talk to this person. Yes. And then departments are able to talk to each other. Yes. So, which I feel like we're just starting to do more of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely networking in a post-COVID world, yeah. being in that virtual space does require that extra step, you know, that extra piece of, you know, being willing to be curious about the other person, maybe ask for, I, I find myself doing that a lot as well, asking for like a, even a 10 minute conversation. Yeah. Hey, can we just meet real quick, 10 minutes? You can kind of explain this to me. Email is a, a very flat 2D environment, yes. right? And that even if it isn't, in a virtual space, that 3D environment really does help yeah. um, making all those connections and, and figuring those things out. Mm -hmm. I think your probably your connections when you were working in the international office really, because you have to interact with all of the departments, right? Yes. All of the areas, all of the different schools. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Inter working within the international. Yes, you got to work with everyone. Um, but also when I was working with School of Media and Design, I worked with the marketing department, yes. Um, and then working with advancement, you get to work with the, the all the donors, the corporate communications. Um, so you, when you get to understand how other departments work, it helps you to do better work for your own department. It's like, oh, I know that they have these requirements. And you can pass that knowledge on and on. So it, rather than going back to the drawing board time after time, it's like, this yeah. is what they need. I can, I'm able to fulfill that. Yeah. It's a, it's a common, common comment that um, people are making sort of through the podcast is being willing to sort of see how things operate as a whole rather yes. than just your small independent yeah. department. Yeah. Yeah. We talked a little bit more uh, earlier about sort of that work-life balance. And I, I, I have such a hard time with that idea because I feel like we really can't separate ourselves yeah. from our work and we can't separate our personal life from our work either. Um, so I'm trying to come up with a new idea around what does that really look like? So, but because at the same rate, I think boundaries and we chatted about that are really important as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe talk a little bit about how you find a bit of balance yeah. now. So I agree. There is no such perfect thing as work-life balance. It, to me, it's a balancing act. You're always going to either be a little too much in this area, a little too much there, but as long as it's evening out and you're feeling like you can balance on that wire, then you're okay. It's, um, we spend, and I remember hearing this title a long time ago, we spend a third of our life at work, a third of our life asleep and a third of our life doing whatever we want. So to think that we, we know the uh, idea of you're done at five o'clock, you don't take work home. That that's not an option a for some people. And it's, mm -hmm. and maybe people don't want to do that. Maybe they love their work and they, and work is a sense of fulfillment. Um, but for me and how I found quote unquote balance, um, I've learned to take time for myself, whether it's waking up and doing a meditation in the morning to set my day off. Correct. Um, taking the mindfulness breaks throughout the day, even if it's five minutes, anything is better than nothing. And I would always say, well, if, you know, if I can't go to the gym for an hour, then I'm not going to go at all. Well, okay. no, like <laughs> yeah. 30 minutes is good. 15 minutes is good. Like, right. It doesn't just because you're not doing it perfectly doesn't mean you're not doing it well. Right. And so for me, it was 
letting go of the perfectionism of having to do everything at 110%. It was, okay, I'll spend 50% of my time here, 30% of my time here. It didn't always have to be 100 in every category. Right. Does that yeah. answer? Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally answers. Um, let's shift a little bit back to um, sort of the industry. Um, let's maybe project yourself. What do you think the next five years is going to look like? I think... I feel like from what I hear from our project managers, our engineers and things like that, is that the need is going to be able to um, digitize pretty much everything. I think the pandemic made that very aware to a lot of people that we need to be able to see into the future, so to speak, recognize the problems that are happening now, know what the history is um, of things. And so with the smart center, we're seeing a lot of people needing or wanting digital twins. So what does that mean? So a digital twin, essentially, and I know I'm going to get the engineering speak wrong. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> what do you think it means? Yes, no, for sure. Um, so to my knowledge, um, a digital twin is a digital representation of a, um, a manufactured part, place, um, pro process, um, it basically is a digital representation of those things. And when you infuse business analytics or informational analytics with it, you're able then to have an if then playroom, if you will. Okay. So if this breaks, then it will affect all of this. I see. Um, if we move this piece of equipment here, then we can do this. So gotcha. it, to me, it's an if then thing. Um, so for us, you know, everyone is all, a lot of companies are downsizing now. We don't have, we don't need the workspaces. People are working remotely and things like that. And one of our clients um, came to us and with that need of, we think we need to buy more real estate, um, but we have this factory as it is. And so what our team did was um, develop a digital twin of their entire floor and said, if you do it like this and plan it this way, again, not an engineer, plan it this way, you can increase your capacity, your efficiencies, optimize your processes and procedures. Um, and so they didn't need to buy any real estate. Yeah. So, so it sounds like a digital exploration place. Exactly. That's, that is so yeah. cool. So that is very interesting. <laughs> what, uh, what gives you hope? People. Mm. My, more importantly, my son, because mm. I see how kind he is and I'm very biased. I know that. Um, <laughs> but I see how kind he is and how interested he is in everyone. And I try to bring that sense of present moment into the people that I'm with. Um, and I feel like people can get a bad rap. Yeah, we're capable of doing a lot of not so great things. But I think in deep down inside in everyone, People just want to be seen, heard, valued, and respected. And I rhyme it off so easily, but it's it's not. And when you meet someone and you connect with them, I feel like it brightens not only them, but it, more importantly, it brightens yourself. And it's just something just so beautiful to have, make connections with other humans. Yeah. What advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, be kind to yourself. <laughs> like, give yourself grace. Yeah. Um, yeah, we work with robots. We aren't robots. Right. Um, just, I say this a lot to my friends and family, just give yourself some grace. Mm -hmm. Like you're learning as you go. You're, we're, we can't be perfect. Yeah. What about advice to students? Don't be afraid to fail in class mm. because yeah, they're marks. It's not life and death. It's right. not career ending mistakes. Yeah. Be be courageous. Try the things you're like, I don't know if this is going to work. Try it anyway. This is your time to experiment. This is your time to learn more about the industry, more about your faculty and talk to your faculty. Oh my gosh, they know things. They know things that will blow your mind. They've worked in industry. They've worked in education. Um, your faculty members are the people that are going to help you succeed. Wonderful. So, yeah. Any other last thoughts that you want to share? I really enjoy working at Conestoga because it, or any large industry, I think for other people, um, there's so much opportunity to move within. And I had that ability to travel the world from international, but from the comfort of my own home or comfort of my own city. 
And right now I'm in that point of my career where I can travel the entire college, but stay in one place and meet people. And it has been so rewarding. So maybe to other people, don't be so easy to just jump ship because the grass is always greener. Right. Grass is greener where you water it. So that's right. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you much for having me. Wow, what a great conversation. Thank you for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Careers. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, follow us on Spotify and subscribe on YouTube. See you in the next one.